I'm honored and delighted to be able to talk to you at a human rights gathering about the consequences of the U.S. and the global war on drugs. I want to try to lay out in these next few minutes why this war on drugs, inspired and promoted by my government, but also institutionalized in the norms and laws of governments and international institutions around the world, constitutes and horrific and gross violation of human rights to an extent that few people have fully appreciated. Let me start with the issue of incarceration. And let me start here in the state of California. The state of California, once known as a state of higher education, now known as a state of higher incarceration. In my country, the United States, which has less than 5% of the world's population, but almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. We rank number one in the world in the per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens. The Russians keep huffing and puffing, trying to keep up. We've left them in the dust, right? Our rates of incarceration are three, five, seven, ten times the rates of those in Europe and elsewhere. From half a million people locked up in 1980 to almost two and a half million people locked up in the United States today. And mind you, these rates of incarceration are not, not typical of American history. We used to be more normal, like everybody else. In fact, they are a modern phenomenon, one in which we are faster to arrest people, to prosecute them, to lock them up. When we lock them up, we lock them up for longer than other countries do. When they come out, we make it easier to say, gotcha, and put them back behind bars. And then even once they're outside the criminal justice system, we continue to teach people like second and third class citizens, depriving them of the right to vote, of access to health benefits, of all sorts of other things, oftentimes for the rest of their lives. Now, what's driven this more than anything else is the war on drugs. If overall incarceration has increased fourfold in the last 30 years, the number of people locked up for violating a drug law, a nonviolent drug offense, has increased from 50,000 in 1980 to over half a million today. And perhaps one third of our overall prison and jail system are now there for violating a drug law. If we in the United States were more normative if our rates of incarceration were more similar to those in other countries, and if another country locked up their citizens the way that we do, we would see that as a gross violation of human rights. Think about it. When you talk about freedom, what does freedom mean? I mean, we see that when a government cuts off somebody's head, that's the grossest violation of human rights. But after that, what is next? Torture? Incarceration, taking people away from their families, putting them behind bars, giving them a number, oftentimes requiring forced labor. That. Think about the people who are subject to torture for days, weeks, or months. And then think if you gave those people a choice between being subject to a month of torture or 10 or 20 years behind bars, which would represent the greater torture? That is the American system. And one of the great tragedies, of course, is that in the debates between Obama and Romney in these coming weeks, the odds are you will not hear a single word about this, the fear to even touch this issue. That is the first element of what is wrong with this global war on drugs and a policy that America is promoting and propagating to the rest of the world. Secondly, this war on drugs is in so many ways about race and about racism. If you look at who's behind bars in this country, many others, it's people who are darker skinned. In my country, where African Americans represent 13 or 14 percent of the population, but 50 percent of the people are incarcerated. In my country, we're one out of every nine black men between the age of 20 and 34 is now incarcerated. In my country, we're one out of every nine black children has a parent incarcerated. In my country, where blacks and Latinos represent less than 30% of the population, but over two-thirds of the incarcerated population. In my country, where blacks and Latinos are disproportionately arrested and prosecuted and incarcerated for drug law violations, notwithstanding the fact that they use and sell drugs illegally at the same rates that white people do.
Racism permeates this cause, permeates this war on drugs in my country and others as well. And in fact, it's not just today in the implementation of these laws. When you look at the history, when you ask the question, how and why is it that certain drugs are treated as legal and others illegal? Certain addicts is legal and others is illegal. Does it have anything to do with the relative risks of these drugs? Does anybody believe that there was once a, a National Academy of Science 100 years ago that looked at all the drugs and said, alcohol, tobacco, these are fine, they'll be legal, and these other ones, these will be illegal? Don't be silly. If you ask the question, why are some drugs treated as a criminal matter and others not, it has very little to do with the relative dangers of these drugs and almost everything to do with who uses and who is perceived to use these drugs. Nobody thought of locking up m millions of middle-aged white women consuming opiates in the 1870s because nobody wanted to put grandma or auntie behind bars. But when the Chinese came and brought with them their opium tradition and were working 100 hours a week and kicking back and smoking their opium pipe the same way white people were smoking, were, were drinking their booze, that's when we got the first opium prohibition laws in this state of California and Nevada. The first cocaine laws directed at blacks in the South, working on the docks and relaxing and taking, you know, smoking some cocaine and white people worrying what would happen when these black men took this white powder up their black noses. And in every case, the fear of what would they do to our women and children. The first marijuana prohibition laws in the Midwest and the Southwest directed at Mexican migrants and Mexican Americans coming up, taking good jobs from good white people, going back, smoking up a little reefer, you know, la cucaracha. Maybe no old thing, right? And of course, the fear once again of these dark-skinned people smoking these funny-smelling cigarettes, and that's when you saw the first criminal laws. And it's not just the United States either. Ask yourself the question, how did an innocuous plant like the coca plant and the chewing of coca leaf become criminalized in international conventions in the absence of any evidence that it was associated with any health harms? Because of westernized elites in the Latin American countries looking down their noses at the impoverished indios with their cheeks bulging with a coca leaf and saying that's why they are so poor and depraved. It must be because of this coca and signing on under pressure from foreign governments to criminalize the cultural tradition that existed in those countries. What else? What happens when you try to criminalize a substance that is demanded and desired by tens of millions of people around the world? Well, the UN said that the global market in drugs may well be worth $400 billion, or 8% of global trade. That was an estimate in the late 1990s. Maybe that's overstated. Maybe it's $200 billion or $300 billion. Whatever we know, it is the largest source of black market economic activity in the world. We know it is a source of revenue for apolitical and politicized criminals and terrorists all around the world. We know it corrupts governments, and we know that it overwhelms, oftentimes, domestic populations and civil government. Look what's happening in Mexico today. 60,000 dead in a war on drugs in the last six years. Look what has been happening in Central America now, which has the highest levels of violence in virtually the entire world. Look what happened before in Colombia and other parts of Latin America. The people in Caribbean are saying, oh my God, just tape it over there, don't push it over here. Look what's happened in East Asia, Southeast Asia and Southwest Asia in the same ways. And look what's happening in Africa as well, where people now see drug-related corruption in markets beginning to overwhelm governments there as well. What you see is that there is no way a war on drugs, a monoduro, can suppress what is effectively a dynamic global commodities market. All of these things are not the consequences of drugs, but of a failed prohibitionist policy. Health, the health consequences. We realized 30 years ago, when HIV began to spread, and it wasn't just among heterosexual people in Africa or homosexual people in other parts of the world, but also by and among people using drugs with syringes. Well, drugs don't spread AIDS, and needles don't spread AIDS, but infected syringes do. Countries like Australia, Netherlands, the UK instantly said, needle exchange programs, let's focus on stopping the spread of AIDS. My country said, sorry, that might be condoning drug use. Better for people to die than to provide them with a clean needle that might facilitate their addiction. So we allowed in this country a quarter million people to be infected and died of HIV AIDS, and other countries allowed the same, notwithstanding abundant evidence that all of this could have been prevented with sensible, pragmatic, public health harm reduction measures. But then there's the other element of human rights and health in the drug war. When a medication like methadone exists to help people deal with their heroin addiction, and when all the evidence suggests that that's the best way to reduce the death, disease, crime, and suffering associated with addiction, 
Why do some countries like the, Russia, for example, ban it, or some states, even the United States until recently? When the evidence overwhelmingly indicates that marijuana can be beneficial in dealing with cancer and, and nausea and, and, and multiple sclerosis and all sorts of other things, why does my federal government continue to promote a myth that this thing does not work? When psychedelics provide ample evidence of helping people deal with PTSD and depression and oncoming death, and there's powerful evidence. Why do countries laugh at this rather than permit this stuff? Those also represent the human rights aspects and human rights violations constituted by the war on drugs. So what I want to tell you is that I consider myself, yes, an advocate for fiscal prudence and an opponent of my country spending a trillion dollars on a war on drugs. Yes, I consider myself an advocate of public health and an advocate for, for, for ending racism in our societies. But fundamentally, I consider myself a human rights advocate advocate and a fight him for freedom and justice. And what I want you to know is that there is, in fact, a growing movement in this country and around the world to end this madness. That here in the United States, we, the new drug policy reform movement, the new movement for freedom and social justice on the block, we see ourselves as standing on the shoulders and following in the footsteps of the movements for gay rights and civil rights and women rights and even the abolition of slavery and the slave trade. We see ourselves as fighting for freedom and social justice. Our opponents appeal to people's fears around the women and children, and we appeal to, to compassion and health. Our opponents represent status quo interests, representing their, you know, whether they're prison corporations or prison guards unions or whatever, helicopter makers or whatever, and we represent the sensible, pragmatic, economic approach that says it makes no sense to be spending oodles of money locking people up when in fact health approaches to deal with addiction would be so much more cost effective and humanly effective. Europe led the way in the 70s and 80s and 90s, scared by AIDS with needle exchange programs and methadone programs and allowing drug addicts to get pharmaceutical heroin and treating addiction as a health issue. Portugal showed you could decriminalize all drug possession without seeing increases in drug use, but while decreasing incarceration and disease and all that. But I will say this, as an American, who has spent many years apologizing for my country all around the world and for the fact that we've been the global champion of the war on drugs, there is one area now where my country is emerging as the global leader, and that is in the area of reforming marijuana policies. Half of all drug arrests are for marijuana, and the racial disproportionate racism is just as profound in that area as in any other area. But now we have ballot initiatives in Washington and Colorado to legally regulate marijuana like alcohol that have a chance of winning. And even as my federal government champions the war on drugs at the level of state government and civil society and public opinion, in fact, we are leading the way towards the transformation of these policies. And I'll tell you also, I am so encouraged by what's happening in Latin America. Because there you see people overwhelmed with the futility of the US-inspired war on drugs saying, enough is enough. Whether it's business leaders in Monterrey or Mexico City, whether it's Javier Cecilia, the social justice movement leader in Mexico who lost his, his, his son to a senseless violence, or whether it's former presidents like Cardoso Gaviria and Zedillo from Brazil and, and Colombia and Mexico heading up a global commission to, to end this craziness, or whether it's now current presidents like Santos in Colombia, Nato Perez Molina in Guatemala, or Calderon in Mexico saying we will fight the war on drugs against the narcos. We will do everything we can to suppress them, but ultimately that is a best a short-term solution. And standing up just this week at the United Nations saying enough is enough, we need a new approach. So ultimately the tide is turning. The tide is turning and what we are aiming for is to create a global drug control regime in the 21st century that does not mimic the failures and costs and human rights abuses of the global drug prohibition of the past century. That's what we're aiming for. And ultimately, I have to tell you, with all the economic arguments, the security arguments, the development arguments, all of that, what I think this really comes down to is a matter of principle. I believe, and I hope you do too, that nobody but nobody deserves to be punished 
simply for what we put in our own bodies absent harm to others. That we are and must be regarded as sovereign of our own minds and bodies and that no state or no employer has the right to take away my freedom or my property or anything else because of what I choose to put in here. That there is no legitimate basis in science, in medicine, in, in ethics or the Bible for that matter for distinguishing between the person who puts drug X in their body and drug Y in their body, between alcohol and marijuana, between cigarettes and cocaine, no basis and no basis for discriminating between the person who's addicted to that substance or that substance. That ultimately when the evidence is there, that we can reduce the harms of drugs and the horrors of drug addiction through ways that do not rely on the criminal justice system and criminalization and security systems and military and torture and incarceration, then we have a moral obligation to rely on alternative policies and to deal with drugs and the phenomena of drugs in this world as much as possible as a matter of science, compassion, health, and human rights. Thank you.